of the world. This is a beautiful line, I'm sure you're all familiar with it. But the important safety tip here is it's not an excuse for arrogance. Right? It's nice to hear someone say, you're the light of the world. But the point is we don't say, well, I'm the light of the world, so listen to me. We always want to keep in mind that apologetics and Christian ministry today is a ministry of humility, right? Humble apologetics. Very important. So our role in the world is to manifest not our own light, which in my sin might actually be darkness, but my role is to shine forth with the light of Christ. So shining forth with the light of Christ. I think that's a good way to characterize what is the role of a Christian in the world? Um, as St. Paul says in Galatians 2.20, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So beautiful. And uh, as my colleague, Father John Baer, reminds often, and I've picked this up, you know, there's that beautiful story in the life of St. Anthony, the great desert ascetic. Um, you know, he'd gone, he'd gone into the, 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 the tombs or the collapsed castle, whatever it was, and he'd done, he'd done you know, hand-to-hand -hand combat with Satan for months, you know. And then it's wonderful because when he comes out, this is, of course, St. Athanasius who wrote the life of Anthony, right? When he comes out, he says, and then Anthony was victorious, or rather, it was Christ who was victorious in Anthony. Beautiful. So it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So uh, we are to be the light of the world because Christ is the light of the world, right? This is not, I mean, Christ says this, you know, you are the light of the world. But then in, in John uh, chapter 8 and chapter 9, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Uh, so everything that we're called to do in terms of our mission, in terms of our evangelization, in terms of apologetics, all of that, we're called to do, I mean, Christ does everything first that he calls us to do. There's nothing that he asks us to do that he hasn't already done first. Um, so now Christ says, I'm the light of the world, but it's important for us to remember, when, in John's Gospel, when does Jesus say that he is glorified? Do you remember? On the cross. Exactly. When he's on the cross. Uh, so in John 13, uh, when, when he had gone out, this is uh, when Judas had gone out, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified. So it's right after he's betrayed. Isn't that interesting? So it is, it's precisely in Christ's betrayal that he is glorified. Uh, now the Son of Man is glorified, and in him God is glorified. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. So this is, again, you see that the thread that I'm weaving here is that we are to be the light of the world because Christ is the light of the world, but when is he glorified? When he's betrayed, when he is most vulnerable. So this is one of the things I think is really essential for our, our work of apologetics and evangelization is this idea of vulnerability. We'll talk more about that later. But when we are evangelizing, when we're engaging with others in theological dialogue, um, are we making ourselves vulnerable? Right? That was one of the things that people mentioned. You know, that, that well, it's hard because you, you're a little bit afraid that somebody might ask you a question you don't know the answer to. Um, so, are we willing to be vulnerable to others? Are we willing to make ourselves vulnerable for the glory of Christ, uh, in the same way that Christ made Himself vulnerable to the glory of God the Father? Uh, so, who are we, and who do we serve? So, Orthodox apologetics is, in my opinion, the true explanation of faith in Jesus Christ. That's the way I define Orthodox apologetics. Now, I want to take a little bit of time, and those of uh, I know Father heard me talk about this at the, in February, but I'm, I'm a, I teach homiletics, I teach rhetoric, so I'm kind of picky about language. And I'm going to put down a challenge to you, that in your discussion, when you talk about you know, things about yourself or when you're talking to others, I would challenge you to not use the word orthodoxy. Now, why? I know, I know there is, that it's, there, there's a tradition for it, but the reason I would challenge you not to use it uh, is, technically, orthodox is the adjective, and Christianity is the noun. And it's rather unusual when you think about it that we've taken the adjective and we've turned it into the noun, right? Like, orthodoxy, what does that mean? Ortho why is that a noun? Why is that a thing? It's Christianity, and we're orthodox Christians, right? It is orthodox Christianity. Um, now, there, there's um, the next bullet, you know, Christendom or the imperial hangover. Um, the, point, the point that I want to make here is that, let's say 50 years ago, um, there was, you know, in North America, just about everyone was a Christian. Just about everyone was a Christian. So it really made sense for Orthodox Christians and all other Christians to kind of define themselves in contradistinction to other Christians. 
So the presumption was, we're living in a Christian culture, we're living, even though it's, you know, it has many jurisdictions, many different, um, uh, how would you say, households of the Christian family, uh, uh, but, but there was this tendency to define ourselves as Orthodox Christians in contradistinction to Roman Catholics, or to, to, to Methodists, or to Lutherans, or to Calvinists, um, or to Episcopalians, or whatever it might be. And so, even that language, right, Catholic, Episcopalian, Lutheran, Calvinist, you see, there's no reference to Christ there. Because the presumption is that everyone's a Christian. And so part of my challenge, where I'm challenging you, is to say, do we still live in a Christian society? Do we still live in Christendom? We don't, right? We don't live there anymore. It's gone. Now, the next thing, the imperial hangover is, don't, 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 um, uh, the, the, the Coptic church, I think, is uniquely uh, healthy in terms of the imperial hangover because, you know, for 15, 1700 years, however many years, the Coptic Christians have lived under intense persecution. Whereas the rest of Christians, certainly Roman uh, Christians in the West, and even Orthodox Christians, have enjoyed uh, millennia of empire. And so, I'm speaking as, a, as, a, as an Eastern Orthodox now, a lot of us, and I think even, you know, Roman Catholic Christians and, and uh, Protestant Christians as well, to some degree, we're, we're suffering from an imperial hangover. Right? We're longing for the glory days. Ah, oh, remember, remember when we used to live in the, in the, imperi in the empire and the, and the czar was a Christian. Well, now you have, in Russia, the, the Russian Orthodox Church is kind of the imperial church. Again, even though you don't call it the czar, it kind of functions that way. Um, but nevertheless, those of us in America, we think, oh my gosh, you know, wouldn't it be nice if it was, it was back, we were back in Christendom, you know, the glory days. Um, and that's what I call the imperial hangover. It's where you, you, you're kind of done in by something that happened to you previously, and you're, you're, it makes you somehow unfit to do your work today. Uh, so be, be careful of that, kind of, that kind of longing for the, old, the good old days. Because Christ never calls us to long for the good old days. He calls us to minister today and to look towards his second coming, right? To always be ready for, for the, the, the o erhomenos, right? The coming one, Christ who is the coming one. So... That's just a, a slight thing to think about as you're, as you're doing, the, the, uh, doing the work of evangelization. To think about how you use those words. Do you refer to Orthodox Christianity or, or are you talking about Orthodoxy? And, and specifically, um, one of the things that is, is really important, in my opinion, is that more and more, it is important to minister to other Christians um, who might be interested in, in being received into the Orthodox Church. But more and more, um, there are the, it's called the, the nuns and duns, right? People who have no affiliation. I think I have a slide here somewhere that gives actually some of the statistics on that. But, you know, the, the Barna group, I think, or the, no, it was Pew, pre Pew Research, did this survey where they showed, you know, over the last five or seven years, there was a dramatic increase in people who said they had no religious affiliation at all. And so for those people, for people who have no Christian background, right? I mean, when you're my age, the vast majority of people in North America will have had no experience in church. They will have not grown up in any church. Um, and so it's only gonna be more and more. And so increasingly, again, I'm, I'm not saying this to in any way critique uh, your efforts, your good, blessed efforts to, to minister to other Christians, but I'm, I'm lay, putting this out there to say, this is what's coming down the road very soon. Very soon, there are going to be far more nuns, people who have no religious affiliation, who are not Christians at all, that we're called to minister to than just kind of ministering within the Christian household. Um, so, uh, and that's the challenge we face, you know, ministering in a pluralistic democratic society where people can be anything they want or they can be nothing at all. Uh, so humble apologetics. So apologetics is, and evangelization is personal. It's personal because Christ is personal. Christ is a divine person. We are, we come into union with God, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit personally. Right uh, through Christ by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so, what does that mean? And I know this is something you already know, but it bears repeating. Uh, understanding the person we're talking to, acknowledging their opposition to faith, if that's whom we're speaking to, um, op they're acknowledging their opposition to faith, to Jesus Christ, and the gospel is essential to Orthodox Christian apologetics. Um, now here, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to focus primarily on engaging with the nuns or the duns. Um, George did a brilliant job of kind of outlining where, where Orthodox Christianity fits within a larger, larger family and, and has given, given us some really good tools to facilitate those discussions. But for the rest of this uh, session, and, and this, is, this session is based on a class that I taught at St. Vladimir's, the specific focus was how do we minister to the outsider? 
How do we minister to the person who either has left the church or has never been in a church? Because that group of people, that demographic, is increasing. It's on the rise. So understanding the person we're talking to and acknowledging their opposition to faith is absolutely critical. You know, without a proper diagnosis, there cannot be healing. Um, if we come at someone and we, we jump the diagnosis, right? We hear a couple words like, oh, I know where you're going with this, and then boom, we jump in. Mm, that can be dangerous because there can be a lot more going on in someone's life um, in terms of their journey of faith than maybe just what they say in terms of what their opposition might be. So understanding the person is really, really critical. Um, now, do unto others. Uh, in Luke uh, 6 and Matthew 7, Jesus says to do unto others as you, as you would have others do unto you. Now, nobody, or very few people, likes to be ambushed on a Saturday morning with pamphlets. Uh, nor do we like to be yelled at as we walk down the sidewalk. And even fewer people like to be berated, insult, or, or branded with pejorative labels, right? Like called an, the ungodly, or the infidel, or the heretic, or the idolater, or the simple-minded, or the heterodox, or whatever it might be. I don't like to be called those things, right? That's not pleasant. Um, so, the question is, you know, do you want someone to come up to you and try to proselytize you into adopting their belief? If we don't want that to be done to us, then in obedience to Christ, we better not do it to someone else. Now, I'm not saying, you know, hang up your, your, your apologist and your evangelist's uh, cloak and, and go do something else. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is think about how you would like someone to engage you in a discussion of faith. How would you like someone to come and ask you about your, about your life in Christ? And then practice that when you engage others. Um, so that you know we're not we're not going to be you know going out with kind of this aggressive edgy oh I know you you're one of those heterodox or you know you're one of those ungodly people or whatever no that's just I don't think that's appropriate I don't think I think we're actually in violation of Christ's commandment um, if we do that so that's pretty much common sense but it's, it bears bears repeating so do unto others so first we should ask how we would like to be approached to discuss matters of faith you know if an atheist wanted to engage you in a meaningful discussion how would you want him to do it. How would you want him to do it? So throw out some examples. What are, how would you like an atheist to come to you and, and engage you in a question of faith? I mean, most of us would probably say, I would just love it, period, right? If an atheist came up to me and said, hey, what's this Christianity thing all about? I think it's a little crazy. I mean, let's, let's just say that people are already doing it, but what would you like? What would, how, what, what would be the kind of engagement? Yeah. Why do you believe in God? Why do you believe in God? Sure, just an honest question. Tell me, why do you believe in God? Sure. What else would you, what, what else would be in a, yeah. If, if they're genuine. Yeah. Exactly. Authentic. So what, authentic. Right. And what does that mean? What, what is the quality of authenticity? They're really seeking. They're not just arguing. Okay. Right, right. And what are they seeking? The truth. Ah, the truth. Okay. They're seeking the truth. But maybe, you know, oftentimes people, it's possible to be authentic, to be seeking the truth, even if they're already convinced that they have the truth. Right. So I would take, I like what you said very much, but I would deepen it a little bit, and I would say that that, that authenticity, I love authenticity, would be the, 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 the really fine, or how can I say it, the, um, uh, well, I'll give you an example. So uh, when I moved into our, we, we, we moved four years ago, and it's a new neighborhood, and across the street there's an elderly gentleman who is a very faithful Jew. I think he might call him, consider himself, a, well, I don't know if he's orthodox or not, but um, very faithful, and he's engaged me in a number of discussions about faith, and he has no interest whatsoever in quote unquote learning the truth because I mean, he already knows that he has the truth. I mean, that's from his perspective, right? That's where he's coming from. But I love engaging with him. Why? Because he's in, the, the authenticity has to do with I care about you. You're my neighbor, and I want to know more about who you are and what you do. So I have no, I have no. Uh, uh, I mean, who knows? You never know. I mean, maybe okay. Mike will want to, you know, at some level become a Christian. I don't know, but I'm not expecting that. But the quality of our engagement is very authentic and very real and substantive. I mean, even my kids are like, Where, where's dad? And my, my, my wife would be like, oh, he's out talking with Mike. And they're like, oh boy, you know. <laughs> These long, long discussions. It's wonderful. It's really wonderful. Uh, but anyway, that authenticity, I think, has to do with, with the, the, authentic, the authenticity of human contact. <laughs> it's an expression of love. Right? Even though, you know, Mike wouldn't say, I love you, I love you, man, you know, you wouldn't do that. Um, but that's an expression of love, to care about someone. To care about someone, say, you know, what, what are you doing? How are your holy days? Or, you know, oh, Easter's coming up, what will you be doing? You know, or is, are, is your Easter the same date as, as all the other Christians this year? Or whatever, you know. 
So that authenticity is really, really important. And yes, that's how we would like to be approached. Somebody else has a hand go up? Uh, yeah. The, like the question I want from like the Yeah, sure. Do you want to go grab a cup of coffee? Yeah, do you want to have a cup of coffee? Sure, absolutely. An invitation to dialogue, right? It doesn't even have to be an atheist. Maybe they're like just an agnostic or, you know, a, a, somebody who's just, you know, I don't know. I don't know what I believe about faith, but I'm, I'm a spiritual person, but I don't think I'm a Christian, so. Fun. Well, but not to presuppose that they already know what I believe and why I believe it. Yes! Oh, say that again. <laughs> that they wouldn't presuppose to know what I believe and why I believe it. Yes, yes. That can be so... Oftentimes we can fall into that trap and say, oh, wait, you know, I studied about... I studied Catholicism. I know what you all believe, you know? So you believe blah, 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 and you spit it out. And that can be so offensive, right? You know, and so, so the idea is that authenticity would be, you know, tell me about your faith. What do you believe? Or you could even say, you know, I've heard that... You know, you can say, you know, the, the, whatever it might be. I've heard that, you know, uh, Orthodox Christians uh, uh, take Mary, mother of Jesus, very seriously. Um, what, what, how do you understand that in your faith tradition? Right? Rather than saying, someone's coming, I understand that you guys worship Mary. Is that true? You know, it's like, wait a minute, right? That's so annoying, right? Uh, anyway, so, so yes, does somebody else have a, no? All right, so but think about that, right? How would we want someone to engage us? And that's how we should engage them. So if someone who is spiritual but not religious wanted to speak with you about matters of faith and spirituality, how would you want her to do it? Um, again, same idea. So do unto others as you, would, as you would have others do unto you. So now we'll get into the nuts and bolts of kind of like how we actually do this, and then we'll get to the exercise. So, oh, and just let me say a few things to you. So in, my, uh, in, my, in the course that I taught in Orthodox Apologetics, we had a number of books that we read, but then a large portion of the class the students had to do field work. They had to do six hours of field work. And what they had to do was they had to have six hours of synchronous. That means they had to actually, where the coffee? Oh, there. They had to actually take them out to coffee, or they could do it on the phone, or they could do it via Skype. But they had to log six hours of synchronous discussion with someone who is an atheist, who is spiritual but not religious, somebody who's an outsider. Um, and what we did then was, before I sent the students out to do this, uh, we, we kind of went through a methodology. We said, well, how do you do this? What are some strategies that you can use? So we didn't just kind of toss them out and say, go. You know, we said, how are you actually going to do this? So what I'm going to do is I'll run through with you some of the basic strategies that, we, that I used with the students and that they then took out into the field. Um, a couple other things I'll mention before I go through the specifics. Um, one of the things I did was I actually had my brother, I think I've mentioned my brother before, who's my longtime apologetics dialogue partner, um, I invited him to come and have a discussion with the class. So he Skyped in, you know, we put him up on the screen, and, uh, and I introduced him to the class. We had a camera so he could see the class. And uh, I said, so, I just asked him questions. So, you know, tell me about your spirituality. What, what's your spirituality? Tell me, what do you think about Christianity? So I asked him a number of these different questions, and he just talked. And so I didn't tell the students, like, look how I do it. That's the way to do it. But the nice thing was, they'd already kind of seen this kind of engagement. So, so they actually had a little bit of a taste of it. They, they were, I even invited them. I said, do you have any questions for my brother? Would you like to chime in? You know, so some of them asked him questions, you know, and he responded. And, and you know, it was really nice. And he said, hey, if any of them will have other questions, you'll give him my email address, that's fine. So again, that point is, I, 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 was, I was so grateful, thanks be to God, mission accomplished, that, that there was that connection, right? It was a human connection. Uh, because that's really the, the, the nuts and bolts of of evangelization is the human connection. Um, do Are we able to establish a friendship, uh, some sort of a friendship, some sort of a caring relationship, or as my, my dear friend uh, Dr. Albert Rossi would say, uh, or can we be a healing presence, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, we, had, we gave them a little taste of what this looked like, and then we also uh, went through uh, some of the basic strategies that are used in clinical pastoral education. Has anyone done CPE or know what that is? No? Oh yeah, you have? All right, so we have at least one person. So you know what this is. So if anyone is training to be a, um, uh, a chaplain, say in a, in a hospital or uh, in the military, they, they have to do this training called clinical pastoral education, where they actually spend time in hospitals talking with people who are, who are sick, family members, and so forth. And they, they practice all these different strategies for active listening, engaging people, and we'll talk about that later. But then they do something called the verbatim. And the verbatim is, after you've done your, your talks or whatever, you go back and you remember one portion of your engagement with that person, something that, would, that really stands out to you, some engagement that you remember. And it's not like you're taping this in the, in the hospital room. 
um, but they just remember it, and then they type it out word for word um, as they remember it. You know, the person said this, I said this, they said this, I said this, and they go through the whole discussion. And then what they do is the students come back and they gather in their group with a, with a, with a supervisor and they go through their verbatims. And the point is to say, what happened in that discussion and why was it important? And also, how did I respond? See, that's a really critical point is, you know, when somebody says something, if that gets my hackles up, right, that makes me angry, well, that's important for me to recognize. Because sometimes it's, it's appropriate to respond with a bit of anger. I mean, if somebody says really, something really offensive, but sometimes it can be very, very, very off-putting, right? You may not want to be angry. Let's say somebody says something that strikes you as really kind of blasphemous or outrageous. Um, it might be the most pastorally sensitive thing to say, to, to not respond aggressively, right? Maybe they didn't mean it as an insult. Maybe it just came out that way. And then, but again, for me to be able to be aware of that, because if I'm going to get angry and I, I, I can't control that or I'm not aware of it, then that can be very problematic. Or there are all sorts of other emotions, like you know, a fear response. If somebody asks me a really hard question, like, <gasps> you know, he asked me this question, you know, I said this, and then, then in the little, you know, as you're going through it, you say, like, when he asked me this, I started to freak out inside because that was the one question I hoped no one would ever ask me, right, or whatever it might be. So the students, they did the, they did the field work, and then they had to do verbatims. And then they brought them back to class and, and we went through them and, and I reviewed them as well. Uh, so it really gave the students an opportunity to be very intentional about their interactions uh, in, in evangelization and, and apologetics. Okay, so kind of the nuts and bolts and then I'll stop talking. So asking questions. Uh, we want to respect the dignity of the person that we engage with. And so we want to politely invite them into discussion. It's almost always best to ask questions, right? What is your story? It's such a simple thing to say, but it's such a wonderful invitation. It's very direct, you know, what's your story? Father, what's your story, right? And, oh, well, you know, and then they can be as, as, as open, they can open up as much as they want. Or, you know, is spirituality important to you? Or how would you describe your personal life, or spiritual life, not personal life? How would you describe your spiritual life? Um, what do you think about Christianity? Um, and there are any number of questions that you can ask to get people to start talking. And in, again, that's, to ask a question like that is an invitation into dialogue. Okay? So we want to invite them into dialogue by asking questions. Then, as they start responding, uh, we want to use active listening. At least one of you know what active listening is. Do anyone else know what active listening is? Okay, a couple people do. So who would like, other than the professional, who would like to give a summary of what active listening is? Anyone? Come on. Yeah, go ahead. So what I understand that you're saying is you want us to explain what active listening is. <laughs> yes, exactly. You got it, right. So you want to, you, you, first of all, you actually listen, but then you echo back. You don't, you, you, you don't, you don't have to always say it exactly, uh, but you can, you can give a summary. You, want to, you, you don't want to, the point is, you don't respond with your own personal thing. So, for example, um, ask me some, uh, I don't know, Father, ask me some sort of, really outrageous, or, or say something really outrageous to me as though you were, you know, uh, an atheist or a, a non-Christian or something. What's up with your clothes? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said, what's up with your clothes? <laughs> You've probably never heard that before, Father. What's up with yours? <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. see, there we go. Exactly. Right. So that would be, that would be the, that would be just responding, right? That means I'm, I'm already, but, but if somebody, to, act, to use active listening, um, my response could be many things, but I could say, uh, uh, you notice I'm not dressed like everyone else, right? So what that says is that unconscious, uh, uh, unconsciously or, or uh, implicitly, it says, it says to Father, oh, he listened to me, right? He got it. He hears what I'm saying. And so you, you can use active listening. It's, it's, it's an easy skill to pick up, uh, but you just have to think about it. And, and it's, it's tricky because normally we don't do it. Normally we don't actively listen. Normally, you know, somebody says, what's up with your clothes? And then I very quickly do this mental calculation, like, is he insulting me? Is he, is he, another, is he a brother clergy? So is he just thinking, you know, like, my, my, my tan cassock is weird? Or, you know, is he, is he just, just kind of funny with me because we're both kind of melting inside of this thing? You know, like, I don't know what's up with my clothes, but I gotta wash them when I get home. I mean, so normally we do a quick assessment of, of what that comment meant to us, and then we respond. Okay? Active listening is not that. Active listening is where you, you listen to what is this person driving at? What, what are they saying to me? And you respond, and what that does, well, how do you think, how do you think it affects the person who's speaking if you, if you use active listening? How do you think it affects them? It Anyone? shows them that you're listening. 
It shows that you're listening? Absolutely. Rather than thinking of your own answer. Exactly. It shows that, I'm going to repeat exactly what he said, it shows that you're listening, not thinking about your own answer. And again, that does that verbally, rhetorically, that's a great way to demonstrate trust, to demonstrate, in a sense, vulnerability. Because you're not trying to put your own idea out there. You're actually listening. I want to hear what you have to say. And I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, and I'm even summarizing what you're saying. OK. So we gratefully respect their response, um, especially their negative response, right? And if, if, it's, if it's a little, if it catches us off, uh, off guard, if it's really frank, if it's really blunt, you know, you can even say, thank, thank you for sharing that, you know? Um, and then we summarize what they say. Um, and, and we demonstrate that we're listening and that you, uh, uh, demonstrate that you are listening and that you understand what they say, even if you don't agree. That was, I, I, I had a moment of, I couldn't read quite well. So demonstrate that you're listening and that you understand what they say, even if you don't agree. And that can be really tricky, especially if someone says something to you that's contrary to the teaching of the church. Uh, it's really, for me, it's a real challenge to, to do active listening. For example, if someone said, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I don't think there's any way that Jesus could possibly have risen from the dead. And I have to say something like, uh, sure, you're, uh, uh, I'm not, I'm not active listening myself, am I? <laughs> uh, uh, so you find the idea, the whole idea of the resurrection, to be totally absurd, and then they say, "Yeah, you know," so, and that's hard. That's a hard thing to say because I want to say, "Well, wait a minute. Let me tell you why Jesus did rise from the dead, or why it's important." Right? So you have to use that active listening, especially when you don't agree. Um, okay. Now, once we once once we listen to them, then we want to explore their position a little bit, right? George mentioned this before about uh, inappropriate questions. Um, you know, we don't always want to answer the question that's asked to us. And, and people may not ask us a question. They might just say something to us. But before we start responding, we want to really tease that out a little bit. What's going on there? What's, what's underneath that? Uh, uh, the, my little, the, the, one of my favorite examples of an inappropriate question is, Father, have you stopped beating your wife yet? <laughs> right? That's an inappropriate question. Why? Because it presupposes something. There's no way you can answer that. Right? You answer yes. That's a problem, right? Because it, it says, yes, I have been beating her, and no, I'm not anymore. If you say no, then it's, uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's a, it's a lose-lose situation. So we want to really make sure that we understand the presuppositions. What are the presuppositions that someone brings? So an, an example of that could be, um, you know, somebody saying, uh, you know, I could never be a Christian because Christianity is, has been the source of the greatest evils that mankind has ever seen. Kind of taking the page from Richard Dawkins. Now, that has a pretty loaded presupposition underneath it, right? This person's saying, I don't want to be a Christian. And the presupposition is that Christianity is the source of evil. So then you don't necessarily want to try to start answering that until you get the person to unpack the presupposition. So you could ask the question, uh, you could active listen. Um, so you think Christianity leads people to do bad things? Yeah, I do. And then you could say, well, what makes you think that? What, what are some examples that, that you know of where, where that's true or where that's happened? So the, the idea is you get them to explore those presuppositions. So you have a better idea where they're coming in from and why they say that, right? Um, it may be that, that they're ba based on something really bizarre, or maybe they're spot on. You know, maybe they'll say, you know, uh, maybe their experience would be, well, you know, um, I, you know, I was abused by a priest when I was an altar boy, um, and I told my parents, and I, t and I, and they told me that to shut up because nobody ever criticizes the priest. Okay, that's that's huge. Right, and so if you're in a situation like that, I mean, thanks be to God, someone has been that bold, open with you. Um, but you have to be, as a you know, God has put you in a remarkably sensitive pastoral situation. Right, how you respond to that is, wow. I mean, that's that's incredibly heavy that somebody could might have, have, have dealt with that. Anyway, you get the point. There are there presuppositions. Um, ask why they hold the belief. What led them to believe or not believe? Um, uh, be sensitive to the emotion that underlies their opinion. Did they have a bad or traumatic experience? So this is really important. Be sensitive to the emotion that underlies their opinion. They might say something like, I believe this, or I don't believe this, or I reject this, or X or Y or Z. And then you want to think, this is where you're, you're thinking, you know, priests do this all the time. Because when we're ministering to people, 
um, we know that there's like the whole person. There's like the intellect, and there's, the, there's, the, there's the mind, there's the soul, there's the spirit. And so you always want to, at least after a few uh, crash and burns, I don't know about you, Father, but you know, <laughs> you get into pastoral ministry and you do things, you're like, whoa, that didn't work so well. And you realize, gosh, there was more to the story, right? You know, I, I needed to listen a little more. I needed to ask a few more questions before I started talking. Um, but, but, but the point is, we're all doing this kind of ministry, even though we're, some of us, uh, most of us are not ordained. So the point is, be sensitive to the emotion that underlies the opinion. And also, the last bullet here, is affirm truth whenever possible. Because somebody might say, like, you know, uh, I don't know, they might say something like, uh, yeah, the Crusades, or I was trying to think of something else to... Uh, yeah, let's say the Crusades. You know, I, I read about the Crusades. You know, I studied them in in, um, uh, in in college, and it just struck me as the most hypocritical thing. I mean, I'm not a Christian, but I, I didn't at all seem Christian to me to take up the sword and go out and lay waste to people because you know for whatever reason. And then if if it was my position, that I would say, well, I totally agree with you, right? And that who did somebody say uh, rolling the opposition? What was that? Oh. What was it? Rolling with, resistance. Rolling with resistance. There you go. So the point is to to affirm, to 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 show the person that that if if and when there's truth in what they say, and just about there's truth in just about everything that people say. Very very rarely does somebody say something that's totally 100 percent wrong. Um, so so uh, roll with opposition, right? Affirm what they say is true, because again that builds trust and that shows that you're actually listening and that you care. Um, and it also is really nice to be able to, to identify places where you agree uh, with someone because, because that's really important. Um, and you know, you may have some dialogues with, with people, apologetic, evangelistic dialogues, where you go for years and years and years and you compile a big list of things on which you agree and you say, and there are those four that we just can't see eye to eye on, right? But we'll come back to them again and talk about them because, you know, I like coffee, you like coffee, and it's your turn to take me out, right? Or <laughs> whatever. Um, so affirm the truth wherever possible. Then, now, finally responding. So it's not like we're only active listening. So the thing is, how do you feel when you hear what they have to say? Be aware of the emotion that you bring to the conversation. I already mentioned this. Then, politely inquire if they'd like to hear what you believe. All right, so somebody says, I believe this and this and this and this. And you can say, you, you hear it, you say, I hear what you're saying. I hear that you know, you've, had this, you've had this horrible experience you know, in a church. Uh, and you decided to leave because you know the, the, the leadership seemed to be totally egotistical and the people, most of them, seemed to be total hypocrites that were just going to church on Sunday to look pious. Um, I hear you. And that would really be hard for me to. It would be hard for me to be in a community like that. Um, would you like to hear about my experience in church? Right? And then someone says, yeah, sure, why not? So again, the, the, the point is you're, you're asking them for permission to tell them your side. Which very, I mean, sometimes people might shut you down, but more often than not, the, the fact that you asked for permission is going to be really powerful. And be like, sure, yeah, sure, fine, Good. tell me what you think. Again, you know, in, do unto others as you would have them do to you. And then uh, engage in apologetic discourse from a confessional, personal perspective. Again, we, I talked earlier about the creed, right? So rather than saying what is, say what we believe. I believe, you know, or I go to, I'm just, the, the, the verb there is believe, but I can say, you know, I go to church because, you know, or, you know, I've been to churches where the leadership seemed a little bit egotistical or whatever, you could, I don't know, but, but uh, that's what people say when they talk about the churches that I've been the pastor at, but no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Hope they, well, maybe they do, who knows. But the point is, you know, or you say, so, so I've been like that, I've been in a situation like that, but I go to church because, and then you give, you, you give the rationale. So whatever it is, if you tell it from your own perspective, it's much more engaging than if we just say, this is so. Or, you know, the church is important because, you know, it gives us the sacraments. I mean, that's true, but it's much more engaging in that, in that relationship, in that dialogue, to say, to say, I go to church because receiving Holy Communion is oftentimes the only thing that gets me through the week. You know, and then you could even, depending on the relationship, you could say, you know, uh, there was a time when, I don't know, whatever, you know, when my mother just passed away. And I'll always remember that time when I received Holy Communion because, you know, I was really at the very end of my hope, the very end of my faith. Um, but somehow, you know, knowing that Christ was there, knowing that Christ hadn't left me, that was so important to me. See, that's very personal. That's very, it's very confessional. 
Um, it's like it, it's the it's the kind of the powerful power of the of the testimonial. Even though like we're not getting up and just being a big soapbox thing, but then there's a place for that, telling your spiritual story. Um, but but again, the point is engage in apologetic discourse from a confessional personal perspective. It really I think it draws the the, the um, your your dialogue partner closer to you personally than if you just say something this is or that is or whatever. Um, an abstract textbook answer may not speak to their concerns. You might think, ah, I've got the perfect answer for this, right? Then, pa pa pa, right? It's almost like the perfect textbook answer can sometimes feel like ordinance that you're loading into a uh, high-powered rifle. Ah, I got just the silver bullet here. Silver bullet, right? <laughs> well, it was, it was part of the show I was talking about. It. What's a silver bullet? Um, anyway, I'm not sure I heard that reference before. Anyway, so you know, you load that here. I've got a, I've got a special ordinance right here. You know, the copper top. <laughs> Boom, right? And the person says, well, gosh, that wasn't very personal. You, you just unloaded this kind of bullet of apologetic data on me, and do you really care about what I'm doing? So um, sometimes the textbook answer, the abstract textbook answer, may not speak to their concerns. Um, we want to demonstrate that faith is a living, vital part of your life. So in your answers, you want to be as, again, the point is not that we're going, we're like ditching reason and we're going solely for emotionalism, right? God forbid you should leave here and think, oh, Father Sergio is just about being emotional. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, it's the, you know, the Orthodox Church is, is not the either or church, it's almost always the both and, right? Look at, think about our, our, our doctrine of the incarnation, right? Is Jesus God or is he man? No, no, we don't say that. He is both. <laughs> He's both and, right? He's both God and man. Almost always, both and answer is what orthodox theology, orthodox Christian theology leads us to. Uh, anyway, so demonstrating that, a, that if faith is a vital, living vital part of our life, we want to be both and in terms of our rational, intellectual, philosophical, theological framework and the way we explain things, but also we want to demonstrate how that faith that is described by that rational discourse is meaningful to me, is life-giving. Yeah, Father. Please. How do we balance, so I understand when you're speaking about the confessional personal perspective in the sense that I'm speaking about what I believe, but how do we avoid falling into the trap of, because there are many Christians that simply have like a private interpretation of scripture where each person just interprets scripture as they see, and so, you know, whenever we hear, I believe, I believe, I believe, then it could be, are you telling me about like your own personal interpretation of what you believe or I mean I feel like some of the things that we want to communicate to someone when we're telling them this is what we believe is that our belief is not based on my personal interpretation but based on you know a reading of uh, the church fathers or you know it's a communal faith that we believe as a whole for different reasons so I understand exactly what you're saying but how do we balance that with with the idea that this is not my own just private interpretation right that's a great question. So first of all, we would never want to say that. We would never say, you know, well, my personal interpretation is. Uh, and I, th I think you can, it, it's pretty, well, you just, to be sensitive to where the person is and where that discussion is. Is it appropriate to say, um, you know, uh, in the Orthodox Church, uh, you know, we believe, right, or, or whatever. Because oftentimes, again, we're talking about nuns and duns here, right? We're talking about people who have little to no Christian connection. If you say, the Bible says, they're like, well, big deal, right? And for some people, that might actually be a negative. Like uh, uh, George was talking earlier about, you know, don't use a Bible verse, right? Because that may that may not work for someone. Uh, so I think you just have to you just have to be sensitive to it and and recognize that if you say, well, the fathers teach, that might be that might be a non-starter for someone. Um, like, okay, which father? What are you talking about? You know, I don't, I don't get that. Like, so, or you could say, you know, well, I read this I read this book by Saint Athanasius, this you know Christian who lived, you know, in whatever. Fourth century, uh, fourth century, yeah, fourth century uh, Egypt, and you know he said da 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 da, and I find that is just incredibly important to me, you know, as I, and this is you know this is what the church believes. Well, anyway, so but, but the idea is always to keep it as personal as possible. But you're right, without giving any implication that well this is just my own thing. Like you know I'm giving you the gospel of, of Sergius. Like right? No, no. Uh, we're, we're 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 proclaiming you know the faith that we have received from the church. Uh, from from the uh, from the fathers and from the apostles. Uh, that's a great question. Did it, did that kind of answer? Yeah. Good. Great. Okay. So uh, da, 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 living final. All right. So vulnerability. Right. We don't want people, especially non Christians, to know that we struggle with our faith or have doubts. Right. You know. That's that's one of the fears that we were talking about. You know, somebody asks a really tough question. 
And let's say they kind of they hit you like you're like, oh gosh, you know, that's actually something I struggle with. How do I answer this? You know, I don't want to show any fear. You know, it's like the sometimes the advice they give if you're walking past a, an aggressive dog, you know, show no fear. You know, it's like, okay, show no fear, right? <laughs> How do I do that? Just thinking show no fear makes me afraid. So I think I show no fear. Um, but you know, if somebody asks you a tough question or asks you a question that really hits, it's personal, then I don't think there's anything wrong with saying, you know, you, a, possible, a possible way to answer that would be, uh, yes, you know, the, 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 church, the church teaches this. This is, this is the teaching of, of, of our church. And I have to say that sometimes this is really difficult for me to understand. That's okay. That's perfectly okay. Um, because, again, you're being honest, right? Honesty, honesty, honesty is so important. And vulnerability, you are, you are allowing that person to see that your faith isn't perfect, right? That you can, you can actually be a Christian, you can be a believer and have doubts, right? That's normal, that's a normal part of, of, of a life of faith and a life in Christ. Um, and, and when you talk about vulnerability, right? God most perfectly demonstrated his power and love and truth by becoming perfectly vulnerable. Right? In the crucifixion, our Lord became absolutely, totally vulnerable. Right? And the only reason in an icon of the crucifixion uh, that Jesus has a loincloth is because of the modesty of the iconographer. Right? Remember, people were stripped naked and they were nailed to the cross. So talk about vulnerability, right? Utterly naked, dying on the cross, and abandoned by everyone except his mother and his beloved disciple. Anyway, so God most perfectly demonstrated his power and love and truth by becoming vulnerable, so we can too. So being mindful of appropriate personal boundaries, uh, make yourself vulnerable to the person to whom you're ministering. So my point there with being mindful of personal boundaries, you don't want to say something that's, that's inappropriate, right? You don't want to unburden your confession on someone that you're talking to. They're like, whoa, dude, like, TMI, right? <laughs> that's too much, you know? But you can still be, you know, without, without divulging too much personal information, you can be vulnerable, right? You can be vulnerable and authentic, like George can be authentic. Um, now, just very quickly, I want to say a couple more things and we can do this exercise. Danger of profiteering, what do I mean by that? Um, I just I want to point out that there's a tendency, when we think about evangelization, that we kind of pick, like, okay, who is the person that we want to evangelize? Okay, I want to pick someone who is, you know, in their, in their mid to late 30s, and they're married, and they have two kids, and, you know, between the two couple, you know, they have at least a $250,000 income, and they drive a late model Mercedes, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, we'd love to have a bunch of those people in our parishes, right? Um, we'd love to have more of those people in our parishes, but, but, this is what I say this is the danger of profiteering. And I'm profiteering, I'm using that word loosely. Uh, St. James gives us a really powerful uh, word about that. He says, My brethren, show no partiality as you hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man with gold rings and in, and in fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, Have a seat here, please, while you say to the poor man, Stand there, or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme that honorable name which was invoked over you? If you, are re if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. So, my point here is, be careful, just be aware of the tendency to want to evangelize the handsome, the powerful, the impressive, the pretty, the rich. Right? Uh, because... Uh, our calling is to minister to the weak, right? All those examples in Matthew 25, um, when, when Jesus says, you know, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was a stranger, you invited me in. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick, um, you, you, uh, you visited me. When I, was, when I was sick and in prison, you visited me. So Jesus is talking about ministry to the weak. And the point here is that the fat, dumb, and happy have little need for a savior. So on a functional level, somebody who thinks that they have it all together and they don't need a savior and they're rich and they've got everything lined up and their career's going great and they've got, you know, uh, you know, two million dollars in the bank, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. Now, I'm not saying that they don't, they don't need a savior. And I'm saying that if, if they come to you and they engage and they want to know about faith, then by all means, you know, 
proclaim, proclaim the good news to them. But keep in mind that coming to that person and, in try, and attempting to engage in faith, in a, in a discussion about faith, and engage in an evangelical uh, apologetic discourse is going to be kind of tricky because they're going to be like, you know, especially if they're, if they're, if they're atheists or if they don't care anything about, about uh, religion or faith, um, they're going to be like, you know, I, I have other things to worry about. Like, this doesn't bother me. Like, why are, why are you wasting my time? Whereas um, there are so many people in this world that are suffering so badly, right? Suffering so very badly. Um, this is my statistic from the, uh, from the Pew Forum. Uh, in the last five years alone, the unaffiliated have increased from just over 15% to just under 20 uh, of all U.S. adults. Their ranks, so think about that, 20%. What's, what's 20% of, I mean, uh, there are 300 million people in the United States? Quick math, that's what, that's 600,000, right? No. What is it? 20% of 300 million is? 60 million. 60 million. There are 60 million people out there who have no formal affiliation to any religion. Um, their ranks now include more than 13 million self-described atheists and agnostics, nearly 6% of the U.S. public, as well as nearly 33 million people who say they have no particular religious affiliation. So, um, there are many people out there who have no connection to Christ whatsoever. Um, the last thing I'm going to mention, uh, this has to do with ministry to the weak. Um, I told this story to Father uh, yesterday. Do any of you know the story, maybe you all know, the story of uh, Deacon Lawrence, the, the, the martyr Lawrence of Rome? Great story. So uh, Lawrence was the deacon, and uh, he was de serving with Pope Sixtus, and there was a persecution. And the governor came and arrested the pope, and, it, and he was taken to trial for being a Christian. And Lawrence said, I'm going with you. And the pope said, no, Lawrence, you have a job. It is not your time. He said, stay and care for the poor. That was, that was his ministry as the deacon. That was what he did. He said, you need to stay and care. So they took the pope away, and they tried him, uh, and they executed him. Uh, he was a martyr. And so Lawrence kept doing his work and doing his work in ministry and serving. And at some point in time, they came and they arrested Lawrence. And they took him before the governor. And he said, are you a Christian? He said, I am a Christian. And he said, well, I understand you're also a deacon. I am a deacon. He said, I understand your job is to care for the, the money and the alms and, and the finances of the church. He said, yes, Your Excellency, that is my job. He said, well, he said, then I want you to bring me the riches of the church. And Lawrence said, Your Excellency, that is going to be difficult because the church is very, very rich. And the emperor, their governor, he rubbed his hands and he said, well then, he said, how long will it take you to bring me the riches of the church? And he said, I'll need, need at least you know, three days or a week. And so the governor said, very well, you have a week, so you know, do it and bring it, bring it back to me in a week's time. Lawrence said, okay. So he went out, he got the leaders of the church together, and he said, sell everything, give all the money to the poor, to the poorest of the poor to the lame, to the lepers, to the widows, to the orphans, to the prostitutes, to everyone. He said, give it all away and ask them if they'd be kind enough to come before the, the, the governor's residence at the end of the week. <laughs> so week comes, Lawrence is there, and the square in front of the, uh, the governor's residence is filled with the, with the, with the off-scouring, the trash, the rabble, the throwaway people of Rome. There they are. And the, and the governor says, Lawrence, he said, what is the meaning of this? And Lawrence says to the governor, Behold the riches of the church. And the governor ordered that he be executed. And Lawrence was a very cheeky saint, a very cheeky martyr, because as they were roasting him over the coals, they burned him alive. He said to the executioner, he said, I'm done on this side, you can turn me over now. <laughs> there you go. But the point, the point of the story is, you know, what is the riches of the church, right? The riches of the church are the poor, the weak, the, the lonely, the abandoned, um, the, the hopeless. Um, uh, and those are the people that will probably be, in my experience, those are the people that will probably be much more prone, much more likely to engage in a discussion about a savior, because they know they need a savior. One more quick little story. Uh, the pastor at the parish where, uh, where I'm attached, uh, he's gone to Africa a number of times. And he tells these amazing stories about how he goes out and they go out into the middle of nowhere, Africa, and they go to a village and he'll preach, right? And there's someone to translate. And he'll finish preaching, you know, he'll preach for like 20 minutes. He'll stop. And then the people will start yelling, there'll be a commotion. And the translator will say, Father, they want you to preach more. And so then he'll preach another 20 minutes and he'll stop. And there's another commotion. What do they want? They want you to preach more, right? So they come out, right? If they see the priest coming, they'll just come out of the village and they'll meet him, right? And they'll say, preach to us, give us a word, teach us about Christ. Now, they don't do that in New Haven, Connecticut, right? Do they do that in Dallas? Do they do that in Dallas? Do they do it in Houston? I don't know. Um, but the point is, if, you're fat, if people are fat, dumb, and happy, they probably don't need a savior. They don't think they need a savior. Um, but the more that we can reach out to those who are in need, those who are suffering, 
those are the people who are probably much more primed to hear that word. Okay, so Eric, how much more time do we have? We have uh, no time, we're out of time. I've used up all the time. Uh, well, um, I really shifted about, about 15 minutes. Oh, so we do the math now. Oh, the panel discussion. Yeah. I've gone five minutes into panel. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, okay. All right, all right. Yeah, yeah. So what we can do is we're going to just try a little bit of role playing for active listening. So if you remember, if, if you don't remember, well, here, here's what you're going to do. So you're going to, we're going to pair up. So find a, find a partner, and then so listen to all the instructions first. So just find a partner, any partner, and then what I want you to do is, I want you to think of uh, one of you to think of, or actually both of you, think of like your toughest question about faith, either one that you've heard or one that you have or one that you had at some point in time. Think of like what is your toughest kind of perspective? Like if you were going to be opposed to Christianity, what would be the toughest question you can think of? And then, what I want, so one of you will be the, the, uh, the nun or the done, right? The outsider, not a Christian, just some outsider. And then the other one, the, the, uh, the Christian, then I want you to invite that person into dialogue, right? So you start off by saying to the non-Christian, um, so tell me your story, or, you know, tell me, what, what do you think about Christianity, or what's your, tell me about your spiritual life, or something like that. And invite that person into dialogue and do active listening. And what we'll do is we'll give you, let's say, we'll try seven minutes, Seven minutes each. Uh, so you have seven minutes, and then I'll, I'll ring the bell, and then you swap, and then you can role play again. So do you understand the instructions? So find a partner, think of your toughest, like, toughest question, toughest opposition to Christianity, um, and then play that, play that role as the non-Christian, and then have the other, the Christian, practice this kind of you know, humble apologetics where you're, um, you're asking questions, you're active listening, um, and then you're, you're inviting, you're, 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 um, you're asking for permission to share your perspective, to share you know, how you live the teaching of the church that we've received. So, make sense? Excellent, all right. So pair up and uh, let's do it. <laughs>